All right, well, good morning, everyone. So nice to be with Linwood again this morning. Uh, just here to tell you right at the beginning, the King is coming. Right? The King is coming. Jesus is coming back. So we have so much hope every Sunday when we gather and we get to remind each other of that wonderful truth, that Jesus is indeed coming back. And so now we get to the privilege of looking at His Word where He's going to speak to us today. And so God's going to speak to us through His Word. And I had the privilege of being with you guys a couple weeks, and we spent our time in 1 Thessalonians, if you remember. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want to invite you now to take your Bibles, and we're going to turn there again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We are getting back to the basics of what it means to be a church family. And uh, we're going to see how Paul, again, uh, he has stuffed so much practical instructions for us here at the end of this letter. And I think it's good for us just to slow down once again and see what the Lord has for us today. And so I'm going to read for us from verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 from verse 12. And specifically, we'll focus on verse 18 for today. So let me read for us. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the lady named Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom. I want to start today by telling you a little story about her life. She was a lady who grew up in a very religious family, and during the Second World War, she and her family helped to hide hundreds of Jews in their home. But what happened was that she got betrayed by even one of her fellow Dutch citizens, and she and the entire family was put in prison. In her book, The Hiding Place, Corrie ten Boom talks about an incident which taught her how to be thankful. How to be thankful. She and her sister Betsy and had just been transferred to the worst German prison camp there ever was. Upon entering the barracks, the barracks is that place where they keep all the prisoners, and I can assure you this was no hotel, they found them to be extremely overcrowded and infested with fleas. So picture this in your mind. The small room with all these people stuffed in, and the fleas are growing in numbers more than the people. And one morning, the two sisters had their Bible reading, and the text was the same text that we're going to study today. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in all circumstances. Betsy told Corey to stop and thank the Lord for every detail of their new living environment. Corey at first flatly refused to give thanks for the fleas, but Betsy persisted. Corey finally gave in. During months spent at the camp, they were surprised because they could openly read their Bibles and study and pray together with none of the gods interfering. At first, they could not figure out why. Why is this so? It was only several months later when they learned that the gods would not enter the barracks because of the fleas. Because of the fleas. And so why am I sharing the story with you this morning? I'll be slowing down again and looking at what it means to be a church family. A church family that is going to build on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going back to the basics. We're all coming back out of lockdown. Everyone's coming out of their little homes again. We're getting back together. We want to know what it looks like to live as a church family. A couple of weeks ago, we saw the importance of how we are to relate to each other as a, fam as a family in Christ. And today I want to talk about something that I think is very important. Something that I believe is crucial in our witness as God's people. But also something that is vital in our relationship with God. And that is thankfulness. Thankfulness. Being a thankful person, no matter what your circumstances are. 
And from this opening illustration, we see that God can use something as disgusting as fleas to turn a reluctant heart of complaining into one that is truly thankful. We see that he orchestrates all the details of life, even to the last flea, so that people can know him and grow in love for him, especially in difficult times. We see that no matter what the circumstances are, Christians should be thankful people. And now we're studying the book of 1 Thessalonians together here. And in this previous time together, we focused on verses 14 and 15, and we saw those five tests of what God wants us to see, of what, what it means to be a family and how we are to relate to one another. But today I want to focus specifically on verse 18. This is what it says. Paul writes, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so I want us to talk about the importance of being a thankful person. Now there are a few things we need to remember when it comes to the situation of the Thessalonians. You remember that what we said before, they were struggling to, and they, they were having pressure from all different angles. They were facing persecution. And if you've read the letter before, you'll remember that the Apostle Paul tells us in the first chapter that they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven. Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And as a result of their newfound faith in Jesus, some of the people have lost their jobs. They've lost their family members, and even their friends. Well, not only that, they were young believers, and like most children, joy and thankfulness are determined by their circumstances, right? If things go well, they're happy and they're thankful. If things don't go so well, they're usually not very happy. They're grumpy and they tend to complain. And unfortunately, I think for many of us, this is how we relate to God. If things go well in our lives, we're happy. But as soon as things get a little difficult, we struggle to have that genuine joy, prayer, and thankfulness. And so if we're going to grow in our witness and influence for Christ, we need to be a people who are overflowing with gratitude. Not only do we need to know how to relate to one another, today's text shows us how important it is in the way we relate to God Himself. And specifically, the importance of being a thankful person. And so to help us understand the importance of being someone that is truly thankful, we're going to look at verse 18, and first we're going to see the instruction. What are we to do? Secondly, the occasion. When are we to do it? And thirdly, the reason why we should do it. And then fourthly and finally, the possibility, how we can do it. Now as Paul is giving his quick list of exhortations here at the end of the letter, he's not really introducing a new idea here. I mean, the idea of giving thanks and being a thankful person as a believer is not something new. In fact, he's simply expressing what the rest of the Bible has been saying for a very long time. Back in the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles 16, 18, we see thanksgiving for deliverance. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Daniel 6, verse 10, we see thanksgiving in prayer. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, and this is the document that says that he can't actually worship God, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber and opened towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. What about the New Testament? Colossians 3, 15 to 17. We see thanksgiving in relation to God and unity and worship. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now what is Paul doing in these final verses of 1 Thessalonians? He's listing several characteristics of what should be evident and true of God's people. Specifically, verses 16 and 18. You could say at first glance when you read this that they appear to be the three impossibles. The three impossibles. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And be thankful in everything. But are they really impossible? 
are, the, are these just simply habits that Christians practice now and again? I don't think so, right? Rather, we see that these are clear signs that should be true of every follower of Jesus. Clear characteristics of what marks the Christian's life. These are the basics of what it means to be a new creation, a person with a new identity in Jesus. But really, is Paul really saying that Christians are to be joyful, prayerful, and thankful at all times? Because what's happening here is that Paul is calling us to a basic, yet radically different outlook on life where the Christian can and should be so thankful as a way of life that they recognize that it's spiritually abnormal for them not to be. And so, before we dive into this text, let me ask you now, are you a thankful person? Are you a thankful person? Would the people around you say that you are a thankful person? And more importantly, would God know that you're a thankful person? I'm absolutely convinced, based on what the Bible says, that if you want to make an impact for Christ in your life, and you're at this church, knowing how to relate to others and how to relate to God, that you don't have to have gone to seminary, you don't have to be this natural leader, you don't have to be an extrovert or the, this amazing communicator, being able to quote the Bible in Hebrew and Greek as you share the gospel with people. But one thing you need to be, that is a really powerful witness in this world today, is being someone that is thankful. Someone that is thankful. But simple, is it not? Being a thankful person? Or is it? Well, let us take a closer look at the instruction. Number one, the instruction. What are we to do? Paul very clearly says, give thanks. Give thanks. And after explaining to the Thessalonian church the importance of relating to the leaders that we saw in verses 12 and 13, and how we are related to each other, verses 14 and 15, he now shifts to the individual. And he wants to exhort them in how they relate to God. And in verse 16, he starts with saying Christians need to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and then we saw in our text, give thanks in all circumstances. Back in chapter 4, he wrote to them and that they may know how they are to live in order to please God. So if you read this letter, you see in chapter 4, he says, this is how you live a life that pleases God. And part of that kind of life is being someone that is thankful. And at the very basic, simple level, giving thanks means what? It's acknowledging through your words and through your deeds the kindness that has been shown to you by someone else. And for the Christian, it means that we have to stop and recognize who we are giving thanks to. And one of the first point, points Paul actually makes in his letter to the Romans, this is so good, look at it, in, in, in Romans 1 verse 21, he talks about unbelievers who do not have this framework. For although they knew God, he says to the unbeliever, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now look at the opposite of that. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And do you see the clear opposites of these two verses? The unbeliever, through their conscience, which is actually also a gift from God, and through general revelation from God and creation, they're able to look at all of that and think about all of that, and their minds are so twisted, and their hearts are so fundamentally broken, that they cannot recognize who God is and be able to give thanks to Him. And so already we see that clearly that ingratitude toward God, being unthankful, is one of the root sins of a person's rebellion against God. But the believer, Paul says in Colossians, because of receiving Jesus as Lord, results in this amazing change. A change where a person is abounding in thanksgiving. And abounding is this picture of overflowing. Thankfulness is something that grows and overflows out of receiving this new, regenerated Christian heart. This is a lifestyle of someone who is constantly thankful. It doesn't stay inside of them, but it overflows out of them and it's evident in their lives. Why? Because of their new relationship with Christ. And we're not talking about the thankfulness you see with kids, you know, when you almost have to beg them to go up to someone and thank them for doing something. No, rather, this is a thankfulness 
that cannot be contained. Many times you see this with new believers. I mean, the new believers, they're just so hungry for God's Word. And they're just amazed by everything. You give them a new book to read and they're like, thank you, thank you, thank you. You teach them about God's love for them and they're like, wow, that's amazing. You teach them about the sovereignty of God like you're going to do tonight and that just blows their minds. But one of the temptations for Christians is the danger of getting so used to knowledge and the blessings of God that we are not in amazement of His grace and mercy. And eventually, people become less thankful and less grateful over time. Think about it as a journey. Someone that travels all over the world. And when you go to a new place for the first time, it's pretty exciting. You experience all these new things. It's like when my wife and I went to the States a couple of years ago for the first time together. We were able to go up the Empire State Building. I mean, imagine this iconic building in America. One of the tallest in New York City. It's amazing. You have these breathtaking views. You can see so much of New York from up there. But when you go back maybe for the third or fourth time, not that we did this. But if you did, you can use to it and slowly but surely you can start to take it for granted. So think about even the people who work there. I mean, this is this amazing view, but as a staff member, they're not interested anymore. They don't want to get to the top. And it shows in the way you talk. It shows in your attitude. When everyone is trying to get to the top and willing to pay a lot of money to do so, you just want to stay at the bottom. And it forces us to stop and think. Is my life overflowing with thankfulness? Or have I become so used to the grace of God in my life and my, the many blessings He gives me that I start to take things for granted? It's not impossible for believers to be thankless. It just shouldn't be the case. And let me give you a practical example of how that even happens in churches. How many people actually thank the worship team or the setup team, the people who serve you on Sundays, for what they do? It can easily become this thing where it's just expected, right? The blessing of someone giving his time and effort to prepare everything to lead us in the service and along with the finances of the rest of the church family, and it all comes from God anyway, and it becomes normal. This is what we do on a Sunday. And so there's this great danger that we need to be careful of. And I'm not saying that you guys are not thankful for the people and what they do. But perhaps if I ask those who are serving in this way, would they say there is a culture of thankfulness that is happening in the life of the church? And what about at your job? Just because someone earns a salary, it's expected for them to do the work, right? And therefore, the need to thank them or be thankful for them goes in the trash with the rest of the week's lunchtime leftovers. And what about at home? When last did you thank your wife or your mom for doing the laundry, for making you dinner? We so easily come, become used to this, expecting these things. And rather, we should be thankful for the many blessings we receive from God. Now, here's the thing. We actually see this in the Bible as well. We see this in the Bible. Consider the event where Jesus was healing people in Luke 17, 11. Let me just read it for you quickly. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Okay, wow, that's pretty amazing, right? Jesus heals all these guys who, who, who he founds on this road. And he tells them, go tell people you're clean now. You would think these guys would all be super thankful, right? Verse 15. Then one of them, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. When you read that, you're like, really? Just one went back to say thank you. Even Jesus is like, really? Just one. Verse 17. Then Jesus answered, We're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. 
This man's faith is what made him to be, not be sick on the outside and sick on the inside. And he's responding with thanksgiving that is overflowing. And so I want us to be careful to look at our own hearts and think of reasons that might cause us to have a sick faith. That might cause us to be ungrateful and take things for granted. When God has blessed us with so much in Jesus Christ. So think with me. What are some reasons that might cause people, more specifically Christians, to become unthankful? Well, one we just mentioned is that they st we start to take things for granted. Another is we become selfish and prideful. Selfish and prideful. People can have this attitude of, well, no one gave me anything. I had to do all this hard work that I, to have what I have. Where they end up thanking themselves more than they thank God. Where all of life is more about them and what they like and what they accomplished. And it's more about the, I deserve this mentality and I don't deserve that mentality. Which can lead to the third problem, which is people becoming critical. Critical. They have a critical spirit that defaults to complaining instead of being thankful. This made me think of another story that I read of a lady called Martha. Well, Martha was trying to grow vegetables in her garden. Someone said to her, Martha, you must be very happy. Everyone is saying how healthy your garden looks this year, especially the potatoes. True, they are pretty good, she said, but what am I going to do when I need to have bad potatoes to feed the pigs? You simply can't win when people become like this. This is a picture of someone who only sees the negative in life rather than the blessings they receive from God and what they can be thankful for. Instead of being quick to have a, a list of things they can praise God for, they even quicker to make a list of everything that goes wrong in their lives. People become experts at complaining about church, about people in the church, about work, about people at work. Okay, but someone would say, I get it, I get it, okay. We need to be thankful people. I get it. I get what you're saying, but man, you don't really understand my circumstances. Life is tough right now. You don't understand what I'm going through in this moment. And that brings us to our second point. The occasion. When are we to be thankful? Paul unashamedly says, in all circumstances. Or as one translation says, in everything. I like how one commentator says it so boldly. He says, that simple, yet direct statement allows believers no excuses to be ungrateful. Paul did not want the Thessalonians and many of the New Testament churches that he wrote to to look at their circumstances and lose perspective of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Rather, he's actually enlarging their worldview. Ephesians 5 verse 20, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, when talking about what to do in living a life of worship, he says, chapter 5 verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you would agree with me that it's easy for people to blame their lack of thankfulness on their circumstances, right? Is that perhaps familiar to you? It seems difficult to have a heart of thankfulness when you just found out you have been retrenched because of COVID. And now you need to find a job when there seems to be no jobs available right now. Or when there's so much change going on in your life, you cannot see what God is doing in all of these things. And when you're married and your spouse is unloving, cruel, and mean to you, how are we supposed to be thankful in these moments? But one thing we notice from what Paul is saying is that he uses his words very carefully here. You have to look down at the text again. He says, we are to give thanks in everything, not for everything. So what? What's the difference? Not only does it mean that thanksgiving is to be this continual action and not just this one-time thing, it shows that this command to be thankful is more about a perspective on life. What it means is that no one is thankful for a car that breaks down, for getting cancer or for having financial problems or marital problems. 
But even when your car does break down or you find out you do have cancer, you do have financial problems, you do have marital problems, we can still give thanks to God in those situations. And one reason believers can do that is because of keeping things in God's perspective. God's perspective. One of the things that Christians always have to keep in the front of their minds when they look at their circumstances is the gospel. The gospel, the fundamental truth that we say we believe about Jesus. And what God is doing in this big redemptive plan of His, driving it all forward until He comes back. And in the Bible we see that God is a giving and generous God. Not only sharing Himself with creation, but He's actively involved in sustaining His creation. Now you guys remember the story of Abraham and Isaac back in Genesis 22. By faith, Abraham was leading his son up a mountain to be a gift and sacrifice to God. And then you get to the New Testament and you read of Jesus, the Son of God, being led up the mountain to go be a sacrifice for God. But unlike Isaac, Jesus knew exactly what was waiting for him in that moment. And amazingly, he doesn't turn around and leave. He knew his circumstances will be filled with rejection, pain, and suffering. And even before that, you read in Luke 22, 19, that he was having this Passover of a meal before his final execution. And do you guys know what Jesus says? Do you remember what he says? And he took the bread, and when he had it, he gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to him, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And to whom did he give thanks? To his father, the very one that's leading him and going to lead him in and through his difficult circumstances. The one who's leading him to the place where he is to be slaughtered for your sins and for my sins. And so think about it. In his hands, Jesus, he's holding this picture of his soon-to-be bloody future. And Jesus is stopping before all of this. And what happens? What does he do? He gives thanks. God not only gave us the most amazing gift there ever is in Jesus, but he also took care of the payment. And when you receive a gift of this magnitude in your life, then believe it, your life is to be marked with thankfulness. Thankfulness. No matter what your circumstances are. Once we see the victory of God achieved in one of the worst places there ever was, the cross of Jesus Christ, our view of our circumstances are turned upside down. God gives you the gift of faith, and now we can live lives that glorify Him and praise Him by living lives of thankfulness. But now, not only do we need to have the right gospel perspective, another important reason we can have confidence and comfort in knowing that we can give thanks in all circumstances is because of knowing that God is in control of every detail of my life. The gospel shows me that God changes me from the inside out, but that's not, that's not all there is to it. In the same way that God orchestrated all the details of providing the substitute animal for Abram, in the same way that He orchestrated all the details of leading Jesus to the cross, and dealing with the specifics of His burial and resurrection, so we can know that God is at work behind the scenes to control our circumstances. Which means we can find comfort and have genuine joy and thanksgiving in them. Paul explains this more in Romans 8, 28. Everyone should know this verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. This is what we call the doctrine of providence. Providence. You need to think about the right doctrine if you're going to make sense of what God doing is in your life. But you can't just think about it. You need to believe the right doctrine if you're going to be a thankful person. J.R. Packer, he helps us understand this doctrine when he says, Providence. God's control over every moment and detail in life is the unceasing activity of the Creator. It means it never stops. Whereby in overflowing bounty and goodwill, I mean, we see God is generous and generous in His goodness. He upholds His creatures in ordered existence. There's total order and control 
from God's perspective. He guides and governs all events, circumstances, and free acts of angels and men, and directs everything to its appointed goal for His own glory. Only God can take the millions of details in one single person's life, the good ones and the bad ones, and makes this picture that by the end makes you more, look like more like Jesus. Someone that's living a life of thankfulness that brings glory to God. It's like those guys who, who like to draw pictures uh, with their hands. I'm not sure if you've ever seen these guys. They dip their hands in the paint and they just start scrubbing. It looks like chaos everywhere. And then after a few minutes, you take a step back and they turn the picture upside down. And whoa, all of a sudden there's someone's face. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. And from a human perspective, the challenge we face is that the things we tend to complain about seem to have little or no value to us in the moment. We don't see what God is doing in the bigger picture of it all. But the doctrine of providence teaches us that all the details of life are significant. God is using everything for our ultimate good and His everlasting glory. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? You remember that it took, took Cory ten Boom a while to realize this. That God could use the fleas to give her freedom to study her Bible, to find comfort in God's Word, while sitting in a prison during a world war where thousands and thousands of people are being killed daily. And so to give thanks in all circumstances or in everything, when life is hard and it feels like everything is going against you, that is to affirm our belief that God is overseeing every detail of our lives. As one man says, you wonder, what could please our Heavenly Father more than for Him to know that we trust Him so much that we are willing to live each moment in a constant state of thankfulness? Is this not why Paul said to the Philippians they are to pray with thankfulness? Philippians 4 verse 7. By recognizing who God is and coming to Him with a heart of thankfulness, thankfulness for who He is, thankfulness for what He's doing, for the gospel, for all the blessings in your life, even if they seem distant and in the past, recognizing what you have before you ask for what you need. And by praying like this, it helps us to fight sadness, anxiety, and discouragement. And not so only should our daily lives be marked with thankfulness, we see our prayer life as well. But is this true of you? Why should we do this? Because the instruction is to give thanks. And why? Paul adds the reason. Because it's God's will for your life. Number three, because it's God's will for your life. Look at the text again. Paul says, we are to give thanks when in all circumstances Good or bad, because this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. In his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul actually had written them about what God's will is for their lives already. In chapter 4, verse 3, he wrote and said, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. God's will for the believer's life is they be holy and set apart from the rest of the world. And now in this section here in verse 18, Paul talks about more qualities that will be visible and evident of that growing process. Constant joy, constant prayer, and constant thankfulness. But here's the thing. We know God wants us to be holy and sexually pure and all those things. We, if you read the rest of chapter 4, you can see that. And, but when someone does something like having wrong, lustful thoughts, or gets involved in immoral behavior, we know that is sin, right? That one is pretty obvious. But when someone is ungrateful or unthankful, what do we do? We make excuses and say, we're just having a bad day. And we're blaming it on our circumstances. Yes, sexually immoral behavior is sin. But do you see what else is sin? Being ungrateful. Living a life of thanklessness. Now, there are a few times in the Bible. I mean, the Bible talks about the will of God for our lives. In 1 Peter 2.15, Peter writes, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. This kind of ties in well with what we looked about 
a couple of weeks ago in how we ought to relate to each other and to the world around us. It's God's will for our lives that we should seek to do good to other people. By doing so, you will silence their foolishness. But then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, we are exhorted not to love the world and the things of the world. And then he says, And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the perspective that we are to have about this life and our circumstances and what God is doing. When we pursue and do the will of God in obedience and in faith, then we can know that God is at work in us. And we can grow in confidence and assurance. And guess what? We'll grow in thankfulness. Thankfulness. We know that it's God's will to send Jesus to his death. It was God's will to raise him from the dead. It was God's will to raise him up and seat him at the right hand of God. It's God's will that now we are to be growing in holiness. And it's God's will that we are to be thankful people. And perhaps you're sitting here and you're hearing all of this and you're thinking, I want to be more thankful. I want to be more thankful. But how? How am I going to do that? And that brings us to our final point. The possibility. How can we do it? How are we going to give thanks in all circumstances knowing that this is the will of God for us as believers? Especially when things are tough and everything just wants to go the opposite direction. Well, Paul gives us the answer. Because the key is in this last phrase of the verse. He writes, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you, what? In Christ Jesus. When Jesus comes to rule and to reign in someone's life, His Holy Spirit does the work of cleansing us from the inside out, so that Jesus can be the King of your life. Paul said to the church in Philippi in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. And so not only do we see that it's the will of God for us in this verse again, which is growing in holiness and obedience, we see the enablement for us to be able to do it. It is God Almighty who is at work in you so that you can do His will. And not to be someone who is complaining about his circumstances. Because look at the very next verse of Philippians. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. And so we see that instead of grumbling and complaining, we know God's will for us is to be thankful. And when you are tempted to grumble about something or someone, rather stop and think about how you can be thankful in that moment instead. Thankful for God giving you the ability and the opportunity to be thankful as a believer. When the rest of the world would be complaining. Can you imagine the testimony to a watching world when we respond with genuine thankfulness amidst a pandemic, when everyone's losing their minds and we're saying, praise God, we are thankful people. But does this mean we cannot be sad when hard things happen in our lives. Of course it doesn't. But we know God never changes. He is always good. And that this is something to always be thankful for. To be able to grieve deeply and to give thanks in hard times is actually a mark of Christian maturity. Paul wrote about this himself. In 2 Corinthians verses six, chapter 6, verse 10. He says, we live as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Is that the way you look at life? When your desire for better circumstances take over your desire for God, then it's going to be impossible to be thankful people. Someone who has received Jesus as Lord, will be someone that is abounding in thankfulness. We saw that, Colossians 2, 6 and 7. And so if you recognize that you're not a thankful person, then may I ask, is it perhaps because you have not received Jesus as Lord in your life? 
Just as someone wears the Springbok jersey doesn't mean he gets to run out on the field when they play against the All Blacks. In a similar way, just because you're sitting in church, I don't want to assume that you have been born again and you are a true follower of Jesus Christ. And people, they hear the exhortation that they need to be thankful people, but why aren't they thankful? Well, again, perhaps it's because they don't have Christ in them. They're trying to give thanks to the, for things, but not in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an empty thanksgiving. A pointless thanksgiving. Without being in union with Jesus, your thanksgiving is only dropping on the floor instead of reaching the ear of God. And worship and genuine praise. And so maybe you feel stuck. Stuck in a life that is discontent and complaining all the time. Stuck in a life that is critical all the time. And you acknowledge that you need to be more thankful, but it feels like you just can't do it. How am I going to do this? Well, as a kid, I remember daydreaming about what it would be like to have the skills of some of my favorite sports players. I'm sure many of the men would understand what I'm talking about. How good it would be to have the, the skills of someone like Tiger Woods. You know, to be able to play golf like Tiger Woods. And so if I invite you to the driving range and I say, hit the ball like Tiger Woods, you would try, but could you do it as well as he does it? I don't think so. Well, what about living the life of Jesus? The Bible tells you to come and live like Jesus. You would try, but you won't be able to do it like he does it. But what if somehow all the skills of Tiger Woods is able to be given to me? And when I go to the driving range, do you think I can hit the ball like Tiger Woods? I think so. And so when Jesus comes to live inside someone's life, the Bible says that's what happens when you become a Christian. You can live a life like this, especially one that is thankful. The answer is not trying to be polite and say thank you more often. The answer is swimming in the grace of God, understanding the cross of God, understanding the providence of God, and living a life that overflows with thanksgiving to God for who He is. Thankful for all the people and details and circumstances that He is controlling in your life, and overflowing with gratitude and praise to Him and to those around you. You need to be in Christ Jesus if you want to live like Christ Jesus. And for that to be a reality, you have to cry out to God to repent of your thanklessness and embrace the love and the free gift of God in Christ Jesus. As one man says, the giving of his son is more than a cold, mechanical, divine donation. God gives because God loves. He loves with an intimate love. And his giving is the overflow of his love in sharing himself with us. And in the same way, Christians, those who have Jesus living inside of them, they should keep the cross and the right doctrine about God and this world and the next in front of them. Like that traveler going on that long train journey. Instead of looking out the window and complaining, are we there yet? Rather, you embrace the beautiful things that God is doing in the world and in your life. You are actively seeking to see the beautiful opportunities to trust God rather than trusting your own understanding. And as God is putting all the pieces together, one by one, you long for the destination of heaven where you will be never be ungrateful again. And so the Bible is clear. We need to be thankful people. We need to give thanks in all circumstances because this is God's will for our lives in Christ Jesus. But practically then, if we're going to create a culture of thankfulness, even here at Linwood or at any church family, what can we do? Because we're getting back to the basics here of church life and relationship with God and with each other. And part of this is being thankful people. So what can we do to help each other be more thankful? As you've said, we need to keep the right perspective of the gospel and truth in front of us and help remind each other of these truths in difficult times. But what else? Because as we read the Bible, we see the people of God giving thanks to God in specific ways. Paul is another good example for us here. Of the 13 letters he wrote in the New Testament, nine of them explicitly give thanks for those who are receiving the letter. He shows us how we can encourage each other and give thanks to God for one another. 
Even in the letter to the Thessalonians, in chapter 1 verse 3, he writes, Give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. And then down again in chapter 2 verse 13, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of the God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but at what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you as believers. And so Paul models to us what it looks like to encourage one another and to give thanks to God verbally for what he is doing in people's lives. And I honestly think this is something we can grow in. Some of us are not very good at saying thank you sometimes. We're like that little boy who went to his friend's birthday party. Maybe you've heard this story before. And when he got home from the party, his mother asked, Johnny, did you thank your friend's mother for the party? Well, I was going to, he replied, but the girl ahead of me said thank you, and the lady told her not to mention it, so I didn't. And that's not the kind of culture that we want to create in the church, is it? No, we quickly want to look at all the ways Paul gives thanks when he writes to all these churches. Let me give you a few examples. All of these are the, the beginning of his letters. Firstly, he gave thanks for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, and Philemon. So when you see someone coming to faith and growing in their faith, thank God by saying to them how thankful you are that God is at work in their lives. Use your words. Secondly, Paul gave thanks for their love for all the saints. Ephesians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, Philemon. When someone does something out of love for you, don't just expect it. Thank them for it. You can love them back by showing appreciation and gratitude for their love and thank God for that love. Thirdly, he gave thanks for their steadfastness, especially in trials. First and second Thessalonians. And many of you have shown this during this lockdown and this COVID situation. In difficult times, your faith in God has encouraged other people. Your thankfulness in hard times has inspired others to be thankful as well. Fourthly, you gave thanks for their spiritual gifts. First Corinthians. God has gifted the church with every believer. And every believer has been gifted by God to serve the church. So when you see people use their gifts for the good of the family, we can thank God for them. That is a good thing. Now, of course, we don't want to flatter people. No, that's not the goal. The goal is to encourage one another and build each other up. And one way to do that is to go to wor like the worship team even after the service and thank them for the effort they put in every week to sing the songs that we sing. We're going to the guys who help with the setup and cleanup of the church and thank them for the sacrificial love and service. Or even to go to your leaders and thank them for the way they lead the church and teach the church and serve the church. God has gifted this church with special gifts and we need to thank Him for it. Fifthly, He gave thanks for their partnership in the gospel. This is Philippians. Philippians. Now what if you took the time and effort to write someone that you know is a partner with you in the gospel? Another church or other people in a different ministry? When we create a culture of thankfulness that overflows out of our lives because of the truth that goes in here, then it's going to be such a motivation for yourself and to others to keep going in the Christian life. Have you ever thought about it like that? When it's hard to do something, and you put a lot of effort into it, and no one says thank you. Let's be honest. That is difficult. That is a hard thing to do. It can be very discouraging. And we don't work hard to get the praises from people, but to honor God. To honor God. So when people say thank you, it is it's such a great motivation, and they, they want to keep going and work even harder. They want to do even more. Because God is at work. He is setting apart from himself people who he is making into the image of his son. And part of that picture is a life that is overflowing with thankfulness. God uses the broken things of this world to make us ready to spend the rest of our lives with him. Broken governments, broken families, and even as we said before, we celebrate the unity and diversity of being different people. And God uses each person in the church, in the family, to make us more like Jesus Christ. 
God is using all these millions of things to prepare us to live with Him for all of eternity. And so we are getting back to the basics here. And today we saw that the command is to give thanks. Not only when things go well, but in any situation. And that we know this is part of God's will for our lives to be thankful people. Who trust in His plan for our lives. Who is at work through everything that happens in our lives. And the most important thing is He's given us His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that those who are united to Him are united to other believers in the church. And together we can create a culture of thankfulness. And help each other be more thankful people. Charles Spurgeon, I think we all know him. Such a godly man and influential preacher till this day, even though he's been dead for a very long time. He wrote about thankfulness. He believed it was a heavenly thing to be thankful. After all, it was gratitude which ought to teach us the divine object of grace. Accordingly, he longed for his heart to burn with the sacred flame of thankfulness. As one comes to understand the grace of God, it results in a fire of thankfulness in our hearts. It's your fire burning. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9.15, Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Let's pray.